All right, folks, here we are. We're uh, in the booth of truth, and yeah. So, where were we? We're in the book uh, confession. Hang on, uh, what are we doing? Uh, uh, we're in the book. What book are we in? I've forgotten. The Cure of Souls, there we go. And we're in chapter four thereof. So we've got about six and a half pages or so. So let's have a go at getting a couple of chapters in the can. Four, Humanistic Confession. A book published in 1989 as a thoroughly modern title, Confessions of an SOB. The author, Alan H. Newharth, allows his former wives and his two children to have their say for and against him. He favours Machiavellianism and holds with respect to advancement. Power, use it or lose it. Newharth may or may not be all that he says he is. Many autobiographies exhibit strange qualities. Ancient hagiographies or biographies of saints credited the saints with more virtue than was realistic and certainly more miraculous powers. Contemporary autobiographies... Uh, contemporary autobiographers... Contemporary autobiographers. Contemporary autobiographers. Contemporary autobiographers sometimes appear to claim more sins than seem possible. Certainly, autobiographies like that of Frank Harris are boastful of more sins than I committed. Nevertheless, if we take such works at face value... Some interesting patterns appear. Among these are instances of pleading guilty to a lesser offence. Thus, the appealing Juliet Huxley in her autobiography, Leaves of the Tulip Tree, 1986, describes sympathetically and uncritically the deep-rooted sense of guilt carried by her husband, the scientist Julian Huxley. She wrote, Julian carried a demon within... When he was four, his younger brother, Trevenin, ooh, Tre Trevenin, when he was four, his younger brother, Trevenin, was born. Until then, he was the sole claimant. I'll try that again. The page breaks are annoying. When he was four, his younger brother, Trevenin, was born. Until then, he was the sole claimant to his mother's love, was spoiled and cherished, and had a position of centrality. He was the grandson of Thomas H. Huxley and of Matthew Arnold. Although the boys were soon the best of friends, Julian saw Trevenin's birth as the beginning of a burden. The... This demon, this demon, this demon... This demon tormented Julian all his life with a sense of guilt. A few months before he died, his wealth, Julian, the wealth, a few months before he died, his wife, Juliet, said to him that this demon within was destroying both of them. He answered quite, he answered quite casually. He answered, quite casually, Of course I have a demon. Had it since I was four. This idea fits nicely with the modern myth of an in, of an inescapable... My mince pies are going to need to adjust this slightly. The old mincers. Going to zoom in there. Like a zoom thing, I'm going to zoom in, baby. Somebody down. Oh, yeah. Oops, that's not right. Where were we? 290. Uh, 290. Let's see, does that fit? Yeah, that'll do nicely, hopefully. This idea fits nicely with the modern myth of an inescapable sibling rivalry. 
When occasionally such rivalry or jealousy may occur, it is neither normal nor common. Even when it does occur, it is absurd to see it as the cause of guilt. Such reasoning is pleading guilty to the lesser offence. In Julian Huxley's case, he was a cold and impersonal man. He was anti-Christian and was contemptuous of the faith. He was also an adulterer who told his wife to find her own solace sexually with other men. He saw this not as a question of morality, but of philosophy. Of his wife and of his work, he wrote to a young woman, In reality, I am a pluralist in my philosophy, having given up the quest for unity. As a humanist, Huxley saw morality as a human product. Julian Huxley suffered all his life from a sense of guilt, which he apparently saw in biological terms after Hoyt, and also in terms of heredity. His grandfather, T. H. Huxley, was a prey to, quote, a deep-rooted melancholy, end quote, and was consequently often seriously ill. Julian Huxley read his problem in terms of this, but T. H. Huxley had much in his life and work to give him a deep sense of guilt also. Julian Huxley at one point was given electric shock therapy, Believing guilt to be biological, he sought ostensibly scientific treatment thereof. He would have regarded the Christian confessional as a magical answer. The shock therapy gave him some recovery for a time, but his basic problem remained. Got that foot problem. What I'm doing there is just turning off, on and off the preamp. I ordered uh, another part. It's going to cost about uh, cost about ninety pounds. That's all right, you know. Uh, coming from Germany, Juliet Huxley, clearly a kindly and loving person, had her own deep sense of sin, which she blamed on her Calvinistic mother. Her mother, however, comes through the autobiography as one of the superior person, as the one, as the one. Su- as the one superior person. Juliet's lack of faith and her reluctant compliance with Julian's demand that she exercise her sexual quote-unquote freedom are not related to this sense of guilt. Juliet's at one point perceptively described Julian as not a physical but a moral invalid and as one who knows or thinks he knows himself accursed and finds his thoughts set upon delft delft destruction. And finds his thoughts set upon self destruction as the only way of removing the curse for himself and the accursed life from being a burden to others. It was the work of Freud to separate the sense of sin from the sense of guilt. He recognized that as long as men see themselves as sinners, they will turn to God for grace. But if they see guilt as a problem of the unconscious, they will seek scientific therapy for help. For Julian Huxley to see sibling rivalry as his lifelong problem, and for Juliet to blame her mother for her sense of guilt, was in both cases pleading to use Edmund, Edmund burglars. to use Edwin Burglar's term, to the lesser offence while concealing the real problem. In other instances, confession of the autobiographical... Oh, clear up, I look up. Confessions. In other instances, confessions of the autobiographical variety seek other justification, that is, sinning as a means to grace, to use biblical language, or... In modern terms, therapeutic and experimental living. An example of this is Rosemary Daniels, sleeping with soldiers in search of the macho man. She's a writer who has received two National Endowment for the Arts grants in literature and has worked as a journalist, an advertising copywriter and a teacher. She has been also a college poet in residence. 
By her own account, Rosemary Danielle has been three times married and divorced. She had gay men friends. She passed discarded lovers on to her daughter. She experimented with lesbianism. She had abortions. She was promiscuous with all kinds of men, especially lower class, was beaten and fought physically with her men, and a psychologist whom she was interviewing pointedly said to her, I hope you're not attracted to drunken, abusive men, which she was. A strong feminist, Ms. Danielle sought out coarse, crude men who saw women only as sexual toys. While sexually aroused by such men, she confessed also to self-disgust. She says of such men, My masochism was more readily satisfied by his craziness. She wanted to be possessed by a strong man. One man, given to sadomasochism in his sexual life, said, I'm just an animal, I guess. I'm just an animal, I guess. I'm just an animal, I guess. And this was his was his favourite. Was his favourite boast. This held an appeal for her, although by her own statements she knew that the relationship was sick. All this was her own, her own form. What a bunch of freaks. All this was her own form of saturation therapy. One wonders, therapy to what end? She had written in one of her poems, Only the sensual are innocent. Innocent of what? Why all this sexual experimentation, which to many would appear to be the most distasteful kind of gutter crawling? Juliet Huxley cited a sentence from Paul Tillichs as basic to Julian Huxley's views, and the words certainly apply as well to Rosemary Danielle. Tillich wrote, quote, The immemorial experience of mankind, that new knowledge can only be won through breaking a taboo, that all autonomous thinking is accompanied by a conscious... All autonomous thinking is accompanied by a consciousness of guilt has been the fundamental experience of my life. End quote. Such thinking has been basic to modern science and to humanism. Emil Durkheim, in his Rules of Sociological Method, wrote of the criminal as an evolutionary pioneer, testing with his lawlessness all the old moral laws in order to pave the possible way to a new freedom. This belief is not new. It was prevalent in Greco-Roman thought, and then and now it is a belief in experience as the key to knowledge. Paul, confronted by such a faith, declares, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Why shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 1 and 2. A wealthy modern patroness of the arts had her son taken to a house of prostitution as a first step towards knowledge, and many similar imitations have taken place. The modern humanistic confession is often related to this. The confessor says in effect, I gained freedom and knowledge by my experience. Go thou and do likewise. The real result, however, is guilt and self-disgust. All right, I'm just doing my best, folks. Five, confession and the image in man. In the mid-1940s, in a conversation with an aged American Indian, I was asked a number of questions about life in white America. For him, however, the contrast was not between white America and red America, but between Christian America and the American Indians. It was his belief that all white Americans were Christian by birth. 
It came as a shock and an enlightenment to him to realize that white America was both Christian and anti-Christian. By his own admission, 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 by his own by his own derp. By his own admission, he assumed a cultural, religious solidarity among white Americans because they were a successful and victorious people. Rifts among Indians between the wolf cult, the peyote people, and the Christian converts were to him understandable because the Indians were a defeated people. Another problem to him was the white Americans' concern over privacy. Having grown up when small bands of Indians, numbering only a very few families, kept apart from other bands of the tribe because of the scarcity of food in the given area, privacy was alien to him. Only the medicine men had secrets. Everything else was known by all, whether good or bad. Years later, it occurred to me how the tribal band functioned, in a sense, as a god in this respect, in Hebrews 4.13 we are told, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In the late 1950s, on one occasion, a white American described this omniscience of God with hostility, calling the Almighty a peeping Tom God. About the same time, a woman insisted that a real God would have better things to do than to spy on her. While most Americans, 90% or more, continued to believe in God, they seemed to think of him as a kindly force who had to be invoked to act. At the same time, the personal security and privacy of a person began to recede steadily, steadily, recede, began to recede. began to recede steadily in American life. The right to privacy was not being invoked, but it was demanded too often for an ostensible right to sin freely. Also, confession in the Christian sense waned greatly, whereas confessions to psychotherapists increased. Even more confessions to anyone began to increase when I was still in my 20s hanging on to a strap in a crowded public conveyance tightly packed at the rush hour, the one standing next to me apologised when a sudden slowdown threw her against me. She then asked who I was, and, learning that I was an ordained clergyman, promptly confessed her sexual transgressions with a married man and asked for counsel and absolution. This temper, which might be called a will to confess, I found over the years to be very common. A police officer told me of the readiness of many criminals to confess. Some leave identification on the premises they have robbed, such as an envelope addressed to themselves. They confess their crime to a friend. <clears throat> Hence the use of police informers or to a cellmate. The need to confess is there, and some having confessed, then choose to repudiate their confession. Granted that, in some instances, such non-Christian confessions have an element of boasting to them, there is all the same a relief that is sought in the act of confessing. Among other things, ungodly confessions are, first, marked by a belief that a confession should automatically bring absolution. Without any true repentance, penance or restitution, some believe that confession automatically brings all their things. All their things? What the what? What to the what to the what what? Some believe that confession automatically brings all these things. They can become, in fact, very indignant if they are not routinely granted forgiveness for confessing. Such people are well described by Proverbs 30.20. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth, and wipeth her mouth, and saith, I have done no wickedness. 
The assumption is that an insignificant matter is involved and a mere admission should end any problem. Confession replaces restitution and in itself is a form of absolution. Second, humanistic premises so govern many that the act of confession is seen as therapeutic. Many parents help further this attitude by requiring their child to confess their wrongdoing and then saying, There, don't you feel better now? With those who believe that confession brings absolution, there is at least a framework of the Christian confessional in mind. It is... To coin a phrase. With those who believe that confession brings absolution, there is at least a framework of the Christian confessional in mind. Where confession is seen as therapeutic, the whole framework has become humanistic. Perhaps some who go to psychotherapists are still confessing to mother, expecting to be blessed for confessing. Confession in Christian doctrine has as its goal penance or restitution. The two can be different as the means to forgiveness. Forgiveness in Scripture is juridical. It means charges dropped because satisfaction has been rendered. It can also mean charges deferred for the time being, as in Christ's word from the cross concerning the Roman soldiers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke twenty-three thirty-four. The whole of the confessional doctrine rests on the necessity for restitution or penance as a precondition of forgiveness. By reducing forgiveness to an emotional change in the offended party, the whole confessional penitential theology is undermined. Its decline is thus easy to understand. This heresy is compounded where forgiveness is granted, where it is not asked for, nor any repentance even remotely in evidence. John Casey has written, quote, A withholding of mercy, a desire for revenge, can be justified on moral grounds. A forgiveness that comes from magnanimity and a disdain for pettiness is also intelligible. What is neither intelligible nor admirable is the modern understanding of forgiveness, which is merely a cant version of Christian doctrine to announce instant forgiveness through broken teeth of men who have just beaten you up and raped your daughter-in-law, as a vicar did a year or two ago, is about as admirable as believing six impossible things before breakfast. End quote. This is, however, what all too many regard as true forgiveness. But even as true confession is unto God, so true forgiveness is also from God and on his terms, the church can administer God's forgiveness, but it cannot forgive on its own. Humanistic confession has been replacing the Christian, even as humanistic forgiveness has increasingly supplanted God's. God, as creator and governor of all things, is the absolute Lord or sovereign over all. His judgments are total and final because he alone is God, and all final reckonings are in his hands. This is a premise of Christian confession. We confess to God because he alone can grant us full absolution and forgiveness through Christ, and he alone can renew us and create a clean heart in us. If sovereignty is transferred from the triune God to man or to some human agency, then so too will judgment and absolution be transferred. The modern state claims to be sovereign, that is, God in its own domain. As a result, it is less and less tolerant of the church's freedom and God's prerogatives. Prerogatives and God's prerogatives and God's prerogatives. And God's prerogatives. Without Christian faith and without confession and faith in the last judgment, the state's courts will seek to be the last judgment of man. According to Revelation 20, 11 to 13, And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled.
from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. The modern state seeks to keep, like God, total books on all men. The modern communications developments have been used to store more data on all citizens, their incomes, financial transactions and more. At one time, the state's information on the people was limited to those with criminal records. Now, all have records. There were no secrets among Indians who lived in small roving bands. This was due to their closeness and also to the prevalence of envy as a means of keeping one another on a common level. Now again, envy is at work and also a hostility to individuality. Former Congressman Ron Paul reported on an incident at the University of Pennsylvania. One young white woman student wrote about her, deep regard for the individual and desire to protect the freedom of all members of society. A black official of the university returned her statement to her, circling her statement, underlining the word individual, and stating, quote, This is a red flag phrase today, which is considered by many to be racist. Arguments that champion the individual over the group ultimately privileges the individuals belonging to the largest or dominant group. End quote. The quote-unquote standard in such cases, and they are many in the states and its law, and they are many, is the states and its law, not God. Confession thus must be to sins specified by the state. This should not surprise us. According to scripture, man was created in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and the essential aspects of that image are knowledge, righteousness, holiness, and dominion, Colossians 3, 10, Ephesians 4, 24, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Now, another doctrine sees man as made by the state and defined by the state. Jan M. Brookman, Professor of Philosophy of Law at and Dean of the Faculty of Law, Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium, has stated, quote, It is necessary to comprehend man as an image of law, end quote. He states also, The natural person is a judicial construction. Again, law and anthropology are deeply connected. For him, law is a social phenomenon, and law is a product. Law is man-made. This is a plain analysis of an anti-biblical concept of man and law. If man is created by the law of the state and is defined by the state, then the limits and boundaries of his life are also the products of the state and its law. Confession by man must then be made to his maker, status law. The tyrant state, the tyrant, the tyrant power state, the tyrant power state. The tyrant power state is then fully in view. Thus, the issues which undergird the doctrine of confession are not trifling ones. The issue is not simply one of supposedly antiquated ecclesiastical practice. It is a question of man's life and freedom. God help us to understand. God help us to do something about this. God help us. God help us. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's about, uh, the uh, camera is about to click. But if you want to support this work, give me a like, give me a message, give me a thumbs up, give me all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, camera's off. 
And if you want to support the work financially to help me do more, better work, get more training, better equipment and so on, like I've had to do to get a clean power supply to stop the bzzz or the shh um, that you might hear occasionally, you can go to nathanteacher.com and click on the donation button. Thank you very much and I hope to see you soon. Soon.